Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hi, everyone. Mark Bellow is here today to talk with us about his new cozy mystery series. The first book is called The Final Steps, and we're going to learn all about it in just a bit. But before we get started, here's the inside scoop on the author. As an attorney and civil justice advocate, author Mark Bellow draws upon over 40 years of courtroom experience in his Zachary Blake legal thriller series. A Michigan native, Mark received his B.A. in English Literature from Oakland University and his law degree from Thomas M. Cooley Law School. After working extremely high-profile legal cases, Mark wanted to give the public a front-row glimpse of what victims face when standing up for justice. Combining his legal experience and his passion for justice with a creative writing style, Mark not only brings high-quality legal services to his clients, but captivating novels to his readers. When Mark's not writing legal and political novels, he writes and posts about fairness and justice and also has a podcast about justice. In his spare time, Mark enjoys traveling and spending time with his family. Mark and his wife, Toby, have four children and nine grandchildren. To learn more about Mark and his work, visit his website at markmbello.com. Well, hi, Mark. Welcome back to Inside Scoop Live. Thank you. So let's just jump right in since we have a lot to talk about today. I guess to start, for listeners who may not be familiar with your work or, or listeners new to our program, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be an author? That's kind of a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Yeah. Uh, I practiced law for over 40 years. When I was a young lawyer in my 30s, I handled a case where a priest molested a couple of boys in the Detroit, Michigan area where I live. The mother of the two boys was a friend of a client of mine, and she came to see me and asked if there was anything that could be done from a litigation standpoint. And long story short, I ended up suing the Catholic Church Mm -hmm. and pursuing a case for the two boys and essentially participated with great dismay in terms of how the church handled the scandal. They lied and they hid things and they transferred people from place to place and if a prior event happened they paid off the victims and sealed the court files. Uh, Witnesses were moved from place to place. You know every organization religious, business, what have you the Boy Scouts uh, had an incident of child abuse Mm -hmm. but not every organization handles the scandal the way the Catholic Church did. They don't do the despicable things that the church administration did. Mm. Uh, There was a report this morning out of Baltimore where a very long-term investigation determined basically a 60-year program of dodge and weave and cover-up and transferring breach from place to place and hiding predators, moving them from town to town. Mm -hmm. Baltimore, by the way, happens to be one of the towns that the priest in my case got transferred to. So it's come full cycle. But anyway, we resolved the case amicably, finally. And I always said the way the case went down and what we went through would make a great book. And I I thought about it being a nonfiction kind of account, but I struggled with writing it and naming names and outing people. So I decided I would write a fictional. And That resulted in my first book in 2016. That book is called Betrayal of Faith. I thought I was a one-and-done author. It was a bucket list item for me. I thought I was done. And then the 2016 election came along, and I thought to myself, is a person who claims to be a bigot, uh, claims to say and do the things that this candidate is doing for real, could a person really get elected who acts like this and says the things he says? Mm Mm-hmm. So I wrote a fictional account of an election at the time, not knowing who was going to win the election. So it was completely fictional. Yeah. It imitated the person who became our president in some respects. I don't want to say he's much more evil, but trying not to be too political here, it was kind of a parody. 
on the candidate, the way he campaigned. What would it look like if a bigot became president, tried to build walls instead of bending fences and deport people, oppress Muslims? What would that look like in America? So mm. I wrote this book, and lo and behold, Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. Mm. I didn't know that would happen. I thought Hillary would, win, frankly. Yeah. And I thought the book was going to be some kind of uh, study in what a Trump presidency would have looked like. Instead, he's president, and now I get attacked on social media for doing a, quote, hit job, unquote, on Donald Trump. And my, res <laughs> and my response was, well, hey, hang on a second. I'll admit that his candidacy, his rhetoric, inspired the character, but I couldn't do a hit job on somebody who hasn't been in office yet. My book is fiction. My book was released before he became president. And if you see a similarity between my guy and your guy, that's on your guy, not on me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Be that as it may, the second book, which was fiction based on things happening in America at the time I wrote it, was something new for me. I wrote the first book out of personal experience. Now I'm writing a kind of a rip from the headlines, law and order type novel. And once I realized I could do that, I didn't even know I could write a book in the first place, even based on my personal experience. So now I realize I can write rather compelling fiction, if I may say so myself, mm -hmm. about topics in the news. And that's what I started to do. Yeah. So here I, here I am, eight Zachary Blake novels into that series, a new cozy mystery that we're about to talk about, starring a former judge by the name of Rosalind Maxwell, and two children's books that deal with safety and social justice issues, and as you know, a Jewish cookbook. So that's where I'm at. I've written now, I guess, 12 novels and a cookbook. So a little more than one and done. <laughs> Very true. Yes. <laughs> Surprisingly yeah. so. Well, I think that's awesome. There's no stopping you now. So the last time you were on the show, we talked about your last Zachary Blake novel, which is a legal thriller series, uh, like you said, but you've branched out from the legal thriller world into the cozy mystery genre. Did Actually, Sherry, the, the mm. transition started with that book, You Have the Right to Remain Silent. Mm. And if you read You Have the Right to Remain Silent, the book read like a cozy mystery. It was a whodunit murder mystery. The protagonist was Zachary Blake, and it, it was such fun to write, outline, and create vis-a-vis -vis doing these ripped-from-the-headline social justice books that I decided to write The Final Steps, the new book, with a new character and start a new series in similar fashion. So if, you, if you read You Have the Right to Remain Silent, you'll kind of see the foreshadowing of writing the final steps. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. Kind of your, your transition. Um, and, and it was different from your other Zachary Blake novels, for sure. I enjoyed it. I remember reading about uh, one of the characters named Sherry, and I knew at the time you named that character for me. And then I, I found out it, she was a real person. So I was like, oh, wow, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you thought that Sherry was you? <laughs> I thought that was me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. She's actually a real person. Uh, she owns a jury consulting business. Yeah. And her and I are LinkedIn friends. And I had her on my podcast, Just Discounts, and I kind of gibbets with her and said, how would you like to be a character in my next book? And she like went crazy. Yeah. Like, uh, what an honor. And I'm excited. And we had long chats about jury consulting and how it works. And I made her a character in the book. It's kind of fun to incorporate a real business and a real character into a fictional yeah, yeah. And I think we talked uh, last year in, in detail about you have the right to remain silent. So I can put the link to that interview in with this one. Uh, readers want to want to backtrack and, and listen to that yeah. one as well. That, that would be fun. Yeah. So tell us, let's let's get into the final steps. What's it all about? The final steps. And here again, it may sound like I did a rip from the headlines kind of thing, but it was a total accident. <laughs> the book is about a murder on campus. And I'm finishing the book, and the Iowa murders happen on the campus of the college in Iowa. Mm. And that was a surprise to me. I did not choose the genre of writing a campus murder story because of the headlines at all. It just coincided with the fact that that happened. This particular murder is the murder of a college law professor, and the accused is the president of the college, who is a good friend of my female protagonist in the book, Rosalind Maxwell. And Rosalind, with some 
hesitation based on the evidence, because the evidence is pretty strong that her friend Tyler might be guilty. Mm. She just won't believe it. And she decides, the former judge, she's just written a book about injustices in the criminal justice system and people who are either incarcerated incorrectly or incarcerated too long for the offense that they've been accused of. And she's written a book that studies that phenomenon. And here is her best friend being charged with murder, and she thinks he's innocent. Mm Mm-hmm. So she decides, even though she has no investigative experience, to take on the task of finding proof of his innocence, despite the local police deciding that he's guilty as hell. Hmm. And that's essentially what the book is about, her quest to prove her best friend innocent. Okay. And, and if innocent, solving the crime and finding the real word. So where did the storyline come from then? It's just something I outlined based on my experience with you have the right to remain silent. Oh. If I hadn't written that one, this book might have been a little more difficult for me. Starting a new series with a new character and writing it from scratch, if you will. <laughs> but having written, even though I, I did call it a cozy mystery, it reads like one. It's a little longer than a typical cozy mystery. Mm-hmm. You have the right to remain silent. But having written that and essentially coming up with four or five suspects, including the accused, I had some experience writing a novel like that, and that's what led me to outline and write this one. Okay, all right. Now, Rosalind has, is he a sidekick, or are they kind of equal partners in this series? Tell us a little bit about Charlie Granger. Well, I think Charlie Granger will become somewhat of a sidekick. He's a late comer to this novel. She takes this task on alone and takes it to a point where she feels she's in danger and decides to call in the cavalry. Mm. Charlie is an old friend of hers, a former cop, someone who has been a private investigator, has been retired now for six months, and she calls him and asks him for help, and together, toward the end of the novel, they unravel the mystery. So I wouldn't say, from the standpoint of your question, that they're on equal footing in this novel. Mm -hmm. They might be on equal footing in any subsequent novel I write, because they end up, well, I'm not going to tell you how they end up. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got to leave something for the reader, right? I guess you kind of guess what I was about to say. <laughs> there will be more from Charlie and Rosalind in the future, I hope. Okay. I came up with a neat little plot idea and made a detailed outline uh, for a, a second Rosalind Maxwell novel, Harbor Spring Cozy Mystery Novel. Okay. I haven't written it, but there is this uh, written uh, synopsis slash outline where both of them are involved in uh, this new crime and trying to solve it. Okay, all right. Do you have plans for like a a whole series? It was planned as a series. Uh, When I wrote it, I thought, okay, she's a compelling character. She's a neat lady, a a very accomplished woman. She was a lawyer for a long time, then a judge for 20 years or so. Then she retired and wrote this neat book that she's about to do a book tour for. And on her first stop in Harbor Springs, Michigan, where her best friend is the president of the college, this murder happens. Yeah. So it kind of sidetracks her from her book tour, and she takes on representing and trying to prove her friend Tyler innocent of the crime. So the intent is to have her continue sleuthing in the future, but we'll see. I I like the outline I wrote and the plot of the proposed second book. But as you know, writing a book, even though I've written a lot of them, isn't easy and you got to put yourself in the right mindset. Right. And I'm busy. Right right now, I'm working on my second children's book. That should be out soon. Uh, Melinda, my illustrator, is, if you recall, uh, Happy Jack, Sad Jack, the first book. Mm -hmm. Melinda's a wonderful illustrator, and I'm kind of waiting on her to illustrate a finished children's book. Oh, because she does her own books as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and she's a, she's a busy lady, and she's worth waiting. The book is written. It's just a question of getting the illustration. Okay. So I, I'm working on that. I'm working on another Zachary Blake. I'm about 100 or so pages into it. I've written about 30,000, 35,000 words. Mm. Uh, and I'm working on a new genre, what I call a legal romance. Uh, oh. I, I found nothing out there. I don't know whether you have, but I found nothing out there. I checked with Harlequin. <laughs> <laughs> And I found nothing out there that's called legal romance. There's medical romance. They like to do romance novels in a hospital setting or a doctor's office. Uh-huh. But I haven't found anything what I call legal romance. 
So I wrote a book, which I just finished. It's now being edited. It's called Licit Lovers. It's a laundromat legal romance novel. Wow. The book is about a young lawyer who decides to go out on her own, and she fights a case with a defense lawyer, beats him, and then they end up sharing space in this old laundromat that is the only place she can afford to rent in her hometown. And it's a love story and a legal novel. Yeah. So I combined the two genres into what I call a legal romance novel. Yeah, a new genre. Yeah, normally it's a legal or a thriller with some romance in it. I would say I leaned more to the romance aspect between the two genres Mm -hmm. than the average legal thriller or legal novel would contain. But I still stayed true to my old self Mm -hmm. and had a couple of rather important issues that the female protagonist cases that she handles that kind of make her a female version of Zachary Blake. Okay. Uh, She's no Zachary Blake yet, but she's well on her way. Writing your Zachary Blake novels, I mean, you know Zachary. You've been writing his character for eight novels now. What was it like writing a new character and developing a brand new character fresh from the start? I like to challenge myself. So Rosalind Maxwell was a challenge. Mm -hmm. And my attitude was, after I was able to write a compelling character, like her, and she really is a dynamic female character. She's a complex character. She has some insecurities, despite being a longtime lawyer and judge, and that makes her kind of compelling, in my opinion. Mm. Writing somebody like that made writing this new character, whose name is Andrea Kramer, a little easier than it would have been to write her fresh. Right. Writing the new genre involved doing a lot of reading and research on romance novels, it's not a romance novel. It's not like the typical romance novel you pick up in the grocery store. Right. Because it has some legal substance to it. But it does have elements of those types of novels. I wrote some rather detailed love scenes that I don't typically write in my legal novel. So Got a little steamy, that, huh? It's a little steamy. By the way, uh, the other thing that I should mention about Licit Lovers is Zachary Blake's in the book. Oh, the, The case that Andrea takes on is quite complex. It's class action, multi-district litigation. Andrea is rather a new lawyer. She achieved some fame by handling a rather controversial rip from the headlines case, Mm. which I'll tell you about in a second. And as a result of the notoriety she gets from the case, she starts getting a bunch of these cases from the new product liability issue which involves a toy company that has a line of toy soldiers that are choke hazards and or chemical exposure hazards. Mm. Kids are getting cancer from being exposed to these, to whatever chemical is used to put these soldiers to. At least that's the allegation. So as she's getting a lot of these cases in her neck of the woods, Zachary Blake is getting, because of his reputation, a lot of cases in his neck of the woods, and they decide to join forces. Oh, okay. And and that's kind of an interesting little twist about licit lovers. Andrew Kramer, what did I call it? The laundromat legal... Romance. Love story or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but it also has Zachary Blake in it. Yeah. The initial case that I mentioned earlier, the rip from the headlines part, is I invented an insurrection that occurs in Lansing, Michigan at the state capitol. Uh, A governor who thought he was going to win loses. The governor who thought he was going to lose wins. The governor who loses refuses to leave office, invites a bunch of white supremacists and neo-nationalists to come to Lansing and protest, and they end up in an insurrection, and Mm -hmm. a young woman gets killed. So Andrea opens her new office. An older man appears at her front door near the time that she opens the office, and he turns out to be the father of this woman who was killed in the insurrection. So she sues the state of Michigan for damages for the loss of her daughter. That case provides a lot of press and headlines and notoriety for Andrea, which results in her getting her hands and feet into the second case. Okay. In the meantime, her opponent in the first case, let's just say that the two of them have this love-hate relationship, and they are on opposite sides of cases, but they are attracted to each other. And that's where the lovers part of the novel comes. 
Okay. I love how you you're branching out and growing, you know, as an author, but you're still keeping your work focused on what you know, basically. And it's very creative right. what you're doing in all these different right. you know, right. genres. Right. 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 Yeah. So the final steps, uh, Harbor Springs, cozy legal mystery. It's a little different than your Zachary Blake series, but is it the same audience or are you finding a new audience as well? I hope so. I think it's a little different. I'll give you two authors. I'll throw them out at you. And mm. I by no means think that I deserve to be lumped with these people, but you know, I'm kind of cocky. I have confidence in my writing, and I like the books I write. Well, you should. <laughs> uh, so I don't think that's a bad thing. But if you look at John Grissom, and you look at Agatha Christie, and you say, are they the same writer? You would say not. Right. So I would say that, that you have the right to remain silent, as you know, because you read it, has elements of a John Grissom novel, but also elements of a Agatha Christie-type novel. Mm-hmm. And so does the final step. Okay. All much right. much more so than you have the right to remain silent. Or Agatha Christie than John Grissom. Now, I know since you've written eight Zachary Blake novels, I know you have a loyal fan base. What kind of reaction to your new book are you getting from those fans? I have a 99 cent free release ebook on Amazon right now of the final step. Uh, people are buying it. I've got three reviews, all five star, and people like it. Nobody has commented that they like it as, quote, different, unquote, than Zachary Blake novels. They just wrote nice things about it and, and liked the novel. Okay. So I haven't, I haven't heard any comments about differences in the genre. But it, for me, it, it was, like, exciting to write something new, both in terms of Rosalind Maxwell and in terms of the book that has yet to be released, the, the legal romance novel. It's fun to do something different. Like you said, you know, branching out, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and I think it, it keeps you interested in, in what you're doing as well. I mean, like, like in my job, there are certain things that I have to do, and I do those, but I love to branch out and learn new things, you know, so same thing with writing your new genres. So you said now it's available for pre-sale. I don't think it's pre-sale. I think it's available as an ebook at a pre-release, for lack of a better way to say it, price. So are you having a launch party? I thought I heard you mention somewhere or heard a rumor somewhere about a launch party online. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that there's going to be a launch party online, although I'm working on it. Okay. Here in the community I live in in Florida, there's going to be a launch party that might turn into a Zoom or a YouTube type video. Okay. There again, it's something fun to do that was different. Yeah. But I, I wrote a little murder mystery to present to the members of our community, starring the members of our community, and that's going to happen on April 24th. It's a private party. It's a book launch, but it's kind of a private book launch. Mm -hmm. I went to the management of the club and said, uh, can I put on this little skit? And if I may say so myself, it's kind of a cute little story. It's called Glen Eagle's Murder Mystery. Glen Eagle's the name of our community. Uh The case of the missing author. Oh. And what happens is that, you know, we're, we're kind of a senior community. And even though I have no particular health issues or memory issues, Mark Bellow, the author, is writing a novel, and in this particular skit, even though it's not true in real life, when he gets to the last stages of the, the novel, he goes off by himself for three weeks and writes at an undisclosed location. Well, he tells his wife that he's almost finished with his novel, and he's about to go to this undisclosed location, but his wife has memory problems and can't hear well, so she, de- so she doesn't hear him declare that he's leaving. Well, suddenly she notices he's missing, and she alerts club security that her husband is missing. And all hell breaks loose, and everybody's looking for this missing author. (laughs) It's not a murder mystery uh, that I have to hide the ending for, because I don't think the people that are involved in my community are going to listen to this podcast. But what essentially happens is, after they're trying to solve the murder of Mark Bellow, Mark Bellow shows up on stage with a finished book, and has it ready to sell there <laughs> everybody in the audience. And, and that book the, is The Final Steps? That book is The Final Steps. <laughs> <laughs> that's so fun. So you said you might do this as a Zoom? I, I'm going to try to get it recorded and put it on YouTube or Zoom. How fun. So when is the actual launch? The book is being released on May 1st. Okay. So what else can you tell us about The Final Steps? It's a great book. It was fun to write. It's fun to read. By the way, I always read after I write. I read as a reader rather than as a writer. 
Mm -hmm. Would I like this book uh, if it was written by a different author? And if I don't, I won't release it. So uh, I like the final step, and I would encourage people to pick it up and let me know whether it fits well in the cozy history genre. Uh, again, I I'm creating my own little mini genre here with both this and the romance novel. As I add a little legal slant to it, I take a little bit from my Zachary Blake experience, and they're not exactly the way a cozy or a romance novel would normally go. Right. Whether, whether you like that or whether you don't like that, it was neat to write, and it's neat to read. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to sign up for the, the romance legal, the legal romance, whatever your new genre you're calling it. <laughs> Well, well, you, well, you, my darling, get an advanced copy, so uh, yeah. I'll, I'd like to hear your opinion. That one sounds right up my alley. Well, Mark, as always, lovely to talk with you. Likewise. By the way, I did a terrific podcast. I had on Leslie Abravino, who has a online newspaper called the Washington Press. Mm -hmm. uh, very left-leaning, but for those people who like left-leaning politics. But the highlight of her is her Twitter page. Mm. And she is just so clever in her use of Twitter. She drove Donald Trump so crazy back in 2016 that he blocked her on Twitter. And she, <laughs> and she used that block as a badge of honor to develop a social media platform that is the envy of anybody like me or you. Anyway, she was on the show along with Robert Keston, who is the executive director of the Stonewall Museum and Archives and Literature in either Miami or Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I just heard something about that place. All right. Now, there's a symposium that is about to take place called SNEP, and Stonewall is a LGBTQ advocacy community. Yep, that's the same place I heard about because we were talking about uh, the trans issue and that, that place came up. Yeah. And I, I had him and her on the same podcast. Oh, wow. The podcast was wonderful. Stonewall has had this symposium, SNAP, for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. The concept was advancing literature involving the LGBTQ community in cooperation with the Broward County Schools. Broward County is a large county in South Florida. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you have SNAP being developed and handled in the last 10 years in Florida with the Florida education community. Well, this year, not a single teacher, one I think one teacher now, or maybe two, is going to participate in this year's symposium because of the DeSantis anti-gay, mm -hmm. stop woke, don't say gay, Book banning. Book banning legislation. Yeah. And that was the reason I had the two of them on the podcast. Oh, how fun. Le Leslie has replaced Trump with DeSantis as her new Twitter character. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you, Sherry, her Twitter page <laughs> is, is just a blast to read. Yeah. And she's got, you know, like a million followers. Right oh, wow. The podcast is going to be broadcast uh, this weekend. The most interesting thing that he said, that's obvious, but we don't think about it. Aside from walk a mile in somebody's shoes, he had a cast of Eleanor Roosevelt's shoe. Mm. And she kind of coined the phrase, walk a mile in someone else's shoes before you pass judgment. Mm -hmm. And he's got a plaster cast of her shoe. Um, <laughs> but the other thing he said that I thought was really interesting, although obvious, is that when you separate out the various communities, ethnic, religious, and otherwise... The LGBT community, plus community, is the only community that touches every other community. Mm-hmm, that's true. A Jewish person is not a Christian person, but a Christian person and a Jewish person could be an LGBT yeah. plus person. Yeah. It is the only minority community that is a part of every other minority <laughs> community and majority community. So I'm going to add a link to that podcast to the show notes in this podcast, because I think it's it would be of interest to a lot of people. Well, Mark, thank you for coming back on the show and talking with us about your latest novel. It was lovely to catch up. It was lovely speaking with you again. Thank you for joining me today for my interview with Mark M. Bello, author of The Final Steps, A Harbor Springs Cozy Legal Mystery. You can learn more about Mark and his work by visiting his website at markmbello.com. And be sure and check out our other interviews on InsideScoopLive.com.